Okay, cool. Go and describe your exact situation right now. Maybe even throw in your personality type. You know, I'm an ISFJ who's having issues with finding my passion in life and I'm not really sure what it is that I want to do. I'm good at this. I'm not good at this. This kind of tires me out. Like just kind of describe your situation. Can you give me a bunch of possibilities of things that I could do with my life? Uh, so just getting used to being able to ask it and, it, um, and, and then finding out where it gives you good answers. And I think it's just like a practice and exposure thing that will lead us to wiser answers from are you saying it's going to coach people of specific personality types to help them find their purpose and career it's going to take my gerb <laughs> <laughs> i uh the, the data that it is fed on in terms of personality typing is you know publicly available articles and all that kind of stuff and so much type uh, information out there is kind of based on stereotypes and you know miscalibrated articles and, and, and whatnot and so the unfortunate fact is is that if you're looking for broad strokes ISFJ advice okay it's probably going to be doing a pretty good job um, but the nuance with which human experience of seeing people incorporating type advice into their life and then having good outcomes from that it doesn't have the fine-tuning necessary to do that at some point but that said that's, that's right. I'm a well-calibrated machine. Yes, exactly. Your large language model <laughs> is pretty impressive. <laughs> that's right. I'm a surgeon. You can't you can't replace a surgeon. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that's really interesting what you're mentioning because as I've been playing around with this idea and, and you know, I was playing with OpenAI before, but ChatGPT is like on a whole nother level. Uh, I was thinking about the DIKW model, which I bring in every once in a while. I talk about um, the model that stands for data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. And the internet has always had the monopoly on data and information. It just has a ton of it. And what it feels like ChatGPT or these large language models are doing is they're bringing in an element of knowledge, right? Like explain to me not just what the pieces of information mean. And of course, you can get advice online and that sort of thing. But it's an aggregate. Give me knowledge about how I should be engaging with this data and information. But the one thing I haven't seen anything replace is wisdom. And wisdom is applied knowledge. And everything you call during the application, which is almost always unpredictable. And there's, a, there's an element that if you're using a technology that is based entirely on pattern recognition of the most likely predictable outcome, there's always a bunch of unpredictable stuff that happens in application. And wisdom is getting to the other side of it and going, what did I learn about myself? What do I understand about a larger picture? What can and cannot be predicted? What are the limitations of certain tools, right? Like that's all a part of wisdom. And you mentioned before, that was what kicked it off is how can a person be wise, right? Like how do we have wisdom? And I think what I'm hearing and maybe this is not the most elegant summary, but what I'm hearing is don't be afraid of technology that hands knowledge over to you. Like we, there were a lot of people who were resistant to the internet, which was a storehouse of data and information. What's interesting is we're heading over into a new technology before we really nailed down our relationship to the previous one. Like it's been hard for people to really understand what to do with this absolute tsunami of data and information. It's been really hard for people to engage with it and understand it. It's, and, and it's almost like we, we rushed to turning it social because we got that. <laughs> like, I, I get how to be social online or social with other human beings. I understand that. So social media just absolutely exploded and took off, in my opinion, in small part, because it's like, I, I think I can get that piece anyway, how to interact with other humans. But it lives on top of, I mean, I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're old enough to remember <laughs> the early days of the internet. You would have been a wee thing, I believe. But there was, um, there was a Wild West feel about the early days of the internet where, uh, do you remember Stumble Upon? Oh, yeah. Do you, did you ever hear, hear about Stumble Upon? Yeah, I was, okay. I was very nerdy very early on. So okay, I, yeah. I got to experience the early Wild West. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. You would have been young, but still you know, uh, uh, able to engage with it. And Stumble Upon was such a magical experience because you would, you just go, hey, just give me a website. Just give me something that, and you'd put in interests. Like I like art and I like science and I like, you know, like I like information about whatever. And it would just take you to different sites that featured those things. And I was always so impressed with it. And what I realized happened over the course of, the, of my relationship to the internet is that I, I used to visit a ton of sites in the early days. Same with me. 
I would go to like hundreds of sites, it felt like. It was very discovery, like a lot of discovery process. You mm -hmm. discover new things all the time on the internet. Yeah. And Stumble Upon was so fantastic because it would introduce me to new things all the time. And I was all over the place. And I realized a few years ago, I think you and I had a conversation about it. It's like pretty soon I'm like on 10 sites, right? And those are just the 10 sites I go to, right? It's like I'm on my site, Personality Hacker, and then I'm on Amazon. And then I'm on like, you know... A while back, I was on Reddit or whatever, and it was, and these were like my ten sites, and I never went anywhere else. and And I was like, "Is Stumble Upon even a thing anymore?" And I don't think it was, or maybe it is. I don't know. But it's like, uh, it's like, it's almost like it got overwhelming, and we weren't sure what to do with all of that data and information. We weren't sure how to create a relationship to it. And um, I'm hearing that. Uh, well, I guess I'm going off on a tangent about how now a new technology which is probably maybe even more important, I'm hearing, than the, the invention of the internet. Now this is giving us knowledge, and we barely knew how to deal with the level of data and information we had before. So the, the best thing you can do is to not fear it, not be afraid of it, but build a healthier relationship to it than maybe even you have with the internet. Right, like do everything you can to build as healthy a relationship with it as early as on, you know, through curiosity and through playing with it and through understanding exactly what it's capable of versus what it isn't capable of and what arguments it won't be the final word on and its limitations, but also how how much it facilitates and how amazing it is. And if we do that, it's never going to take over wisdom. There's not a tool made yet that will replace the wisdom of experience. But it can help facilitate all that so much faster. It's like the speed of it is the is the part that's so impressive. So, I mean, I guess that's like sort of my take on how to see all of this, but I don't know if I've nailed it.